Saudi Arabia, long inaccessible to most foreign journalists, has opened up in recent months to American reporters. Elizabeth Farnsworth and a NewsHour crew just returned. Here's their first report. A visitor to Saudi Arabia is struck by images that often seem discordant. There's downtown Riyadh with its modern architecture, traffic jams, and trendy shopping malls. And then there are the women who still cover themselves head to toe with veil and abaya, the robe all females, including foreigners, must wear in public. There's the black gold that powers our modern life. Saudi Arabia sits on about 25% of the world's known oil reserves. And then there are camel races, like this one at a folk festival in Riyadh that was the big social event last month. Little boys aged seven or eight served as jockeys, and a Toyota SUV went to the winner. We came to Saudi Arabia to see as much of its culture and people as we could, and to learn about the place that produced Osama bin Laden and 15 of the 19 hijackers. We started at the folk festival, which Crown Prince Abdullah attended. He's the de facto ruler of the kingdom, as it's called. His half-brother, the king, has long been ill, and Prince Abdullah governs in his stead in what some people have called the most absolute monarchy in the world. This is the spectacle he saw on stage that night. It was broadcast live on Saudi television. It tied the ruling family directly to the glories of the Islamic past and specifically to the great Muslim warrior Salah Hadin, who retook Jerusalem from Christian crusaders nine centuries ago. A film about Salah Hadin was intercut with news footage of Israeli soldiers shooting Palestinians. Jerusalem will be ours once more, the Arabic says. This is the sword of Salah Hadin, and it must be unsheathed again. This is just the kind of rhetoric American newspaper columnists and analysts have jumped on since September 11th, as they lambasted the kingdom for extremist views. In Time Magazine's words, for example, Saudi Arabia, quote, fanned al-Qaeda's hateful cause and still harbors a populace that fervently supports it. Saudis have been blindsided by the criticisms, said Hussein Shabokshi, a business leader in Jeddah. It's no longer Bin Laden at issue here. It's the country of Saudi Arabia at issue. It is the religion of Islam at issue. This is where we have to differentiate. This is where we have to really tread lightly because Bin Laden is going to be history in a couple of months. But Saudi Arabia is here to stay and so is Islam. The hijackers of September 11th came from all parts of Saudi Arabia and especially from the southwest, from the province of Asir. Five were from the area around Abha, capital of Asir. Two attended this College of Islamic Law. One was Imam at this mosque. We were among the first American TV crews to get access to this place. Our experience as a news crew reflected what seems to be a very dynamic but confusing process underway here. At times we were allowed much freedom to shoot and do what we wanted to do. At other times people were warned away from talking to us and it was often hard to determine why or by whom. Some people spoke openly with us about their criticisms, for example, of the extremism of some religious leaders here. Others feared speaking on camera about those matters, saying they could lose jobs or worse. We came to believe there were deep differences in Saudi Arabia about September 11th and the kingdom's role in the attacks, and we found a strong reluctance to air dirty laundry publicly. Many of the people we spoke to refused to believe the hijackers were Saudi at all. This is the version the Americans have adopted. It hasn't been proven yet. We and the rest of the world are waiting for evidence. I think they are, uh, most of them are not from Saudi Arabia and we are surprised if there is any of them is from Saudi Arabia. Because as you know, we are, uh, the people in Saudi Arabia are beautiful. 
Most people we talked to did condemn bin Laden and the attacks of September 11th. Islam is against killing innocent people, even if they are not Muslims. Saudi Arabia. But a survey carried out by Saudi intelligence and reported in the New York Times last month revealed that 95 percent of educated people aged 25 to 41 very much supported bin Laden. Sami Angawi, an architect in Jeddah, said he was surprised to find that his teenage son's friends considered bin Laden a hero. My son and his friends, they were here in the house three days after the incident. And I was uh, kind of asked them, what do you think of Bin Laden? They shrugged their shoulders, they didn't know. A week later, they were also here, and one of them said, Amu, do you know, you asked us about Bin Laden, and we didn't tell you, but do you know what we think, he's a hero. That disturbed me. Really, your son and his friends? And his, my son was quiet. Uh -huh. His friends said, he's a hero, that really disturbed me. We asked a group of journalists and business leaders, some of them friends of Angawi, to gather at the home of a newspaper editor in Jeddah one night to help us understand more about the Saudi reaction to September 11th and bin Laden. The, the support that came for bin Laden came because they considered bin Laden as a folk hero uh, and he twitched the nose of the, uh, of the giant. And this group insisted the support was directly related to people's anger at American politicians' support for Israel. They're more pro-Israel than the Israelis. And we consider them, you know, your politicians, we, we consider them fanatics, you know. They're fanatically pro-Israel. So it really antagonizes the whole thing. You know? The news every day, watching innocent children and innocent Palestinians dying or being killed or abused or tortured or whatever, you can't help but feel the rage, feel the anger. So of course we'll be sympathetic towards anyone who stands up and says, stop it, enough is enough. So this is what is happening. This is how the Arab world feels. And the Palestinian suicide bombings of Israelis, she said, should be understood as self-defense. The group was also very concerned about the criticisms of Saudi Arabia in the American media. We are surprised, we're shocked. Uh, our government, our people have never said anything bad about America except, of course, you know, look, you've got to uh, rethink your support towards Israel. But we, you know, we didn't start this campaign. Uh, we are fighting it. Uh, we, we're hoping it subsides. Meanwhile, our host, Khalid al Maina and his wife, Samar, and others have brought children back from schools or jobs in the United States and are enrolling them at home or in Europe instead. Most had stories about family and friends in the United States. Hussein Shabokshi's sister was in Boston in September. She was with my father uh, in Mass General. Basically, he was having some uh, medical checkups and an operation. And on the 12th of September, uh, she's a veiled uh, girl. Uh, they came into her hotel room, uh, I think members of the FBI and the local police, and uh, interrogated her and aggressively beat her up. Uh, she had a 20 centimeter slash on her face. There was a mistaken identity. <laughs> so that's uh, putting it mildly, I guess, because of her fiance's name is Muhammad Attar, and they mistaken him for Muhammad Atta. And it was six hours later till things cleared up. Muhammad Atta was the name of the Egyptian who is believed to have led the hijackers of September 11th. And there are people like Yassin Qadi who may lose their fortunes because of the attacks. He studied and worked in the United States and then built a business empire in Jeddah, including diamonds, real estate, and high-tech interests. He's one of the Saudis whose assets have been frozen by the U.S. Treasury, which charged they were used to support international terrorism. As far as I know, we were never engaged in, uh, in helping any terrorist group whatsoever. If we discover that an employee did something wrong, we're ready to hear it, we're ready to take all legal action against him if that happened. But according to my knowledge, I never heard something like that. I never know something like that. How badly hurt are you economically right now? <laughs> very bad? very bad, very bad. Qadi met Osama bin Laden in Jeddah in the 1980s and then again in Afghanistan. Uh, my uncle took me <laughs> at that time for uh, what's so called to help these lord war uh, warlords to get together so i was young he took me with me with with him and i think i saw also osama at one meeting in that but but that's that's you know 
How many American officials saw Osama? How many people from Europe saw Osama? How many politicians saw Osama? Saudi officials have also frozen Yassin Qadi's local bank accounts and are monitoring more than 100 accounts of other prominent people at the request of U.S. law enforcement agencies, according to press reports. Security forces have also arrested al-Qaeda suspects, and Adel al-Jubair, foreign affairs advisor to Crown Prince Abdullah, said the kingdom is cooperating in other ways, too. The cooperation between the two countries is excellent. Um, everything that Saudi Arabia could do, Saudi Arabia has provided. Um, there are a number of things that we have prov that uh, we were able to establish that, that we shared with the U.S. and vice versa. At the end of the day, we are both victims of this uh, terrorism and we both have an interest in rooting it out. On the public relations front, Crown Prince Abdullah gave a rare on-the-record interview to the New York Times and Washington Post, affirming the kingdom's close ties with the United States. He recognized that most of the 19 hijackers were Saudi. Deviants, he called them. He also said it's hard to defend America now because of what he implied was a bias towards Israel in the conflict with the Palestinians. The Crown Prince also urged religious leaders to avoid extremist language and actions. Nevertheless, most Saudis we talked to refused to concede that problems in Saudi society could have contributed to September 11th. Nothing went wrong here. As Khalid said, we had 10, 11, 12, or 20 bad guys, okay, if I can call them that, out of 20 million people. That doesn't mean that something went wrong in Saudi Arabia. Sociologist Fatina Shakur said many Saudis may sound defensive now because they're sensitive to the criticisms from abroad. But she thinks there is a problem. The voice of moderate or middle Islam isn't heard. Yes, we have a problem. And we don't realize that we have a problem only now because 9-11 happened and now because you are here and you are trying to find out. We've been saying this over the years. Mm -hmm. Look, guys, responsible people, decision makers, we have problems in the education system, we have problems in the family system, we have problems in terms of religion. The, the middle Islam, the voice of the middle Islam has been silenced. Even at the top, there is a new awareness that perhaps all is not well in the kingdom. Prince Turki al-Faisal is half-brother of the king and was for 25 years director of Saudi intelligence. He retired shortly before September 11th. A society that, that whose, whose, whose makeup is based on, on a religion, a religion of tolerance and the religion of, uh, of understanding and the religions of, of extending the hand of friendship and yet someone can come and hijack some of these ideals and put them to the service of, of, of murder and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the killing of innocent people, which is 100% contrary to all the teachings that, that we have been taught in, in, in our lives. It gives one pause. And in our next report, we'll look more deeply at the Saudi debate over Islam, education, and culture. Now, the second of Elizabeth Farnsworth's reports on the fallout in Saudi Arabia from September 11. The Hajj, the yearly pilgrimage of Muslims to the holy sites of Mecca, is underway. More than a million and a half people have poured into Saudi Arabia for the observance of prayer and rituals that reaches its height next week. They go to the great mosque in Mecca. Many encircle the Kaaba a shrine believed to have been built by Abraham. One billion Muslims worldwide face in the direction of the Kaaba when they pray. Saudi Arabia is the center of the Muslim world, and Islam is at the heart of Saudi life. It's also at the heart of a global controversy, because Osama bin Laden and 15 of the 19 hijackers of September 11th were Saudis who cited their religion as justification for what they did. We began our look at this controversy at a folk festival in Riyadh whose two themes were Islam and Palestine. A poet famous in the kingdom read a new work for an audience that included Crown Prince Abdullah, 
who has been the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia since his half-brother the king became ill. The poet spoke of Islam as the dawn waiting to light the quote, Zionist night. He condemned the West for blaming Muslims for acts he said they haven't done. They clad us with a strange cloth of terrorism and blame us for every despicable deed, he said. Our religion is our soul. We will not compromise. The West has given civilization a bloody and distorted face. They filled the earth with science, but weakened it with inequity and shame. Most every Saudi we spoke to over a period of nearly two weeks agreed with the poet that Islam and the kingdom are being blamed unfairly for al-Qaeda's murderous attacks. But Prince Turki al-Faisal, who retired last fall after 25 years as head of Saudi intelligence and who is half-brother of the king, said Saudis are in a state of deep introspection about their countrymen who hijacked the planes. Where does he come from? He's a Saudi, and yet he's willing to go and kill himself in the name of something that is totally alien to what a Saudi is or what a Muslim is. So let us look back and see who are these people and where do they come from. If they are Saudis, then let us see what made them uh, go that way, what made them go astray. What do you think? How do you answer that I don't question? know. I don't know. And this is why this process of introspection and, and retrospection is very important for us here in the kingdom. Look, the whole society here uh, is based on religion. I am a product of that society. My children are products of that society. We have been taught our religion uh, since the, the, uh, the country was established more than 70 years ago. And it's a pretty good record for, for, for any society that over these 70 years that you can count a handful of, of individuals who have been led astray. We heard a similar view from the Deputy Minister of Islamic Affairs. I wore a scarf and robe with religious authorities. He told us what his ministry was doing differently as a result of September 11th. We are addressing this on two fronts. First, we are trying to clarify the portrait of Islam that it has nothing to do with terrorism. That message is addressed directly to non-Muslims, especially in the United States. Secondly, we have a duty to educate Muslims in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere that anyone committing terrorist acts in the name of Islam is not representing the religion because it's a tolerant faith. It was almost impossible in Saudi Arabia to hear a contrary view, though some people criticized religious leaders off camera and not for attribution. There is little religious freedom in the kingdom, no Christian churches no Jewish temples, few Shiite, as opposed to the majority Sunni, Imams. Sociologist Fatina Shakur is a devout Muslim who did speak openly about her concerns. She was a Fulbright scholar in the United States, then taught in Jeddah. She worries that in Saudi Arabia, moderate Islam has lost its voice. So many Saudis, good Saudis, good minds have been excluded from the real process of development because of the extremist religion, the extremist voice of religion. Now the government has realized that it has done wrong by really giving credit to these people. And now, as, as probably you have heard, that Crown Prince Abdullah really came out on, on, on the TV and said, no extremism anymore, no extremism anymore. All children in Saudi Arabia in private or public schools spend part of each day studying religion. This teacher taught a lesson about modesty and respecting others' rights the day we visited. Only one sort of Islam is taught in Saudi schools. It's often referred to as Wahhabism or Wahhabi Islam, though we were told Salafi is the proper term. The students learn that Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was an 18th century preacher who advocated a very basic Islam, as he believed it was taught by Muhammad. The preacher's descendants and the Al Saud family united Saudi Arabia, marrying religion and politics. That marriage has been good for this part of the world, according to Prince Faisal bin Salman, a member of the ruling family, 
who teaches political science at a university in Riyadh. It has been very good for Saudi Arabia. Um, the Islamic message is very much um, transregional and, and super tribal. It unified this part of the world. It has achieved uh, security, it has achieved stability, it has achieved, achieved central governance. But whatever its successes, the Salafi Islam taught under the guidance of Sheikh Wahab's heirs is not universally popular here, and many people find it excessively restrictive. <laughs> Jeddah architect Sami Angawi and his artist wife Amira review their son's religious homework after school. On this day, one son's class had been studying innovation in religion, and the textbook said much innovation is haram, forbidden. Sami Angawi, who considers himself deeply religious, told his son there were other ways of seeing things, too. Oh, they told me in the school this, and I have to adjust it and say, well, they tell you that, but there is a different view. Mm -hmm. Our view is this and this, and other people may have a different view, and it's okay, but respect their view, and they should respect their yours. Some books used in schools have specific passages that have been criticized in newspaper articles in the United States. One passage from a high school book reads, quote, Muslims will fight the Jews just before the Day of Judgment and will destroy them until the Jew will hide behind a tree or stone and the tree and stone will say, Muslim, servant of God, here's a Jew behind me. Come, kill him. University professor Faisal bin Salman has reviewed the textbooks. He found this passage, but said it's one of few which would be considered objectionable. About 10 to 12 pages are taught uh, in Saudi schools where people might interpret as um, uh, um, containing text which is anti-non-Muslim. Uh, but if you compare that to over 20,000 pages that students read from day one at school until they graduate, I mean, how does that measure up statistically? I think to uh, pinpoint the curriculum as a cause for extremism uh, uh, is, is, is very much an oversimplification of what's going on. What do you think the key causes are? If you look at the whole question of the political system, I mean, some say, well, you have terrorism because there is a lack of democracy. Well, how do you explain terrorism in Spain or Northern Ireland, for example? So. Let's not try and find a cause that would explain everything. I think the, uh, the, the answer will have to be much more complex and much more limited to certain instances and certain individuals at the time. So what are some of the other causes of terrorism we wanted to know? Dr. Mane al-Johani, Secretary General of the World Assembly of Muslim Youth, which runs camps and other programs all over the world, pointed, as most people here do, to U.S. support for Israel. He also said many Saudis bitterly resent the presence of American troops in the land that is home to Mecca and Medina. Uh, this kind of feeling, it is definitely not only bin, uh, bin Laden's feeling, it is shared by many youth, by many uh, uh, religious leaders, and uh, they have uh, uh, I mean, voiced this uh, through various means. I asked him if he agreed with that view. Not necessarily. No, I don't agree with that. I know there are... Uh, their existence, it has certain uh, I mean, negative uh, uh, aspect as well as positive uh, aspect. But I don't look at it in that, uh, I mean, uh, complete uh, uh, negative uh, way. He insisted al-Qaeda's terrorists learned their murderous ways not in Saudi Arabia, but in Afghanistan. It became a meeting place of various uh, 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 people from various countries with different ideologies. And many of the Saudis in Afghanistan were indoctrinated with, uh, 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 I mean, certain ideologies and ideas that are not actually uh, approved of in this country. And to tell you the truth, this is probably the, maybe the, the, the crux of the, of the problem. Al-Johani's organization has been accused by exiled Saudi dissidents of helping fund camps and schools in Pakistan and elsewhere that produced recruits for al-Qaeda. But he insisted these charges were untrue. By and large, our camps and what's taught in those camps and uh, the ideology we try to 
uh, actually inculcate in the youth, it does not in any way encourage extremism or terrorism or what have you. Uh, so definitely, of course, there are individuals here and there who might uh, go off the track. Fatina Shakar said she is convinced that important changes are underway in her country's practice and teaching of Islam. As a response to the Crown Prince's denunciation of extremism, she said, more moderate voices are making themselves heard. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is good. Mm -hmm. This is good. If we are going to talk about positive coming out of the negative, light coming out of the dark, of course the price has been very high, very, very high. It should not have happened that way. But now the middle voice of Islam is really coming out, and I hope real Islam. And out of that, I hope real understanding between West and East, between Christians and Muslims, between Jews and, and Muslims, the three religions and other people as well would happen. While we were in Saudi Arabia, many people pointed to planned curriculum reforms as a sign that leaders were willing to change. But earlier this month, a leading Saudi cleric denounced such attempts at reform as, quote, conspiracies by unbelievers aiming to hurt Islam. It was one more example of a struggle that seems to be underway here over how best to respond to September 11th. Much of that struggle is occurring places few foreigners can penetrate. But as we traveled in the kingdom, and in the countryside of Asir province in particular, we were struck by a deep sadness among many Saudis that they are being tarred with the terrorist's brush. Ali Magawi is a teacher and museum director in Asir, the province that was home to five of the 15 Saudi hijackers. Before September 11th, tourism was providing a good source of income to many people here. Now the flow of people from outside the country has almost stopped. We are uh, very sad because they, uh, when, when I, uh, for, for example, go to any place like, like USA, Germany, Europe, uh, Australian, they said, oh, this is from us here, he's a tourist. So, so I'm not that. I am a religious man, and I'm, I have a culture, I have a, a heritage, I have a history, I'm a teacher, I, am, I, I like all the world. So why, why did they told, uh, said that I am uh, I'm a tourist? And it is a really, really a, a wrong idea. Ali Magawi says he's hoping for the healing effects of time, so once again he can feel welcome abroad, and American tourists will return. We'll have Elizabeth's third report from Saudi Arabia next week. Still to come on the news hour. Finally tonight, part three of Elizabeth Farnsworth's series from Saudi Arabia. This one on how a house reflects one view of Islam. Jeddah is a city of more than a million on the Red Sea that has long served as the gateway for Muslim pilgrims traveling to nearby Mecca and Medina. Muslims from all over the world have settled here, making the city a melting pot of people and ideas, of old and new. The old is visible downtown, where wood lattices cover windows on buildings constructed long ago. Streets are narrow, and shops are small and intimate. New Jeddah can be seen on the great boulevard leading to the Red Sea, where dozens of modern sculptures line miles of street and beach. Children play here as families picnic on their day off. Architect Sami Angawi comes from an old Jeddah family descended from the Prophet Muhammad. He's an authority on the architecture of his region and his religion. He has spent the last 10 years building a home that he hopes embodies both. The house here is a reflection of the traditional Hijazi architecture. And Hijazi, explain what that means. Hijazi is, is the local region here, uh, which is an ancient name for this region. And Hijaz has always been the reflecting point. It's the melting pot of the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. So you can see something in Hijaz, which is from India, and you see something from Morocco, and something from Turkey, and something from Yemen. Everything is, is, is a, a reflection of the idea of the unity and diversity. My statement here is that to live in the time now, you don't have to forget your tradition. So it's the balance between the constant and the variable. And that's how it's always been in Islamic uh, tradition, Islamic architecture. 
Angawi has designed into his house the dualities he thinks Islam embraces. The home is very private, but also open to the world, as he thinks his religion has been. Many openings to the outside are screened, but light permeates every room, flowing through windows that evoke Islam and Christianity alike. There's a sunken dining area that feels like Japan, and tiles from various parts of the Muslim world. The designs of the tiles are themselves works of art, as are the quotes from the Quran and other details. Well, as you'll notice as you walk in the house, um, from one place to another, it's really like walking in my mind. What do you mean? <laughs> what I mean is, is that's how my mind works. I see things from different perspectives. I see it in layers. I see it in details. And that's why I look even at our Islamic culture and Islamic concept from different perspective and that's how we have to see it now what do you mean not single-minded not just seeing one thing you have to see more than one thing in order to reach the balance because you cannot have balance with just one sided mm -hmm. scale Angawi contrasts his vision of his religion with the more fundamentalist vision of Islam that has become familiar to foreigners since September 11th he sees his house as an example of the true jihad, as opposed to jihad as holy war. There was always a choice in, in what is called jihad, which is again misunderstood by Muslims and by non-Muslims. Uh, jihad is start with yourself, with your inside, with your body, with your family, with your house. This is jihad what I'm trying to do. The beauty you see is the jihad of trying to do something beautiful. It's almost as if in your art and in your person, you want to embody this vision of Islam that you think is the proper one or, or is the way it should be? How would you put it? I put it as I'm, I'm not inventing anything. I put it that I'm, I'm part of a tradition, a part of a heritage which is 1,400 years old. If we only take it to the Prophet Muhammad, if we take it to Abraham, it's at least 5,000 years old or how old is it, how long ago Abraham was. And it's a continuity of tradition, not only ours, but uh, the tradition since the beginning of time. We believe in continuity. In the past, Angawi said, Islam was open to many influences and traditions. And this is what made it a great civilization. He's worried that in Saudi Arabia, the cradle of the religion, Islam has become restricted to one narrow interpretation that is intolerant of other views. The way it's thought is mainly mainly in one direction of one view again i'm not saying it's right or wrong this is not for me i'm not a religious specialist but i know when i look at my islamic culture and islamic tradition and and civilization i know that one of the reasons that we did have this great civilization is because different views are represented mm -hmm. the flexibility that was there the adaptability that was there and we very much need that now to bring that back and to teach our children how to have a dialogue, how to discuss, how to interact with other people, how to be friends and how to follow the Prophet. The Prophet at that time had said, my companions are like the stars, whichever one you follow, you are in the right path. And so that even though the, the companions have many different opinions, and he didn't say, shut up, and you go right and he's wrong, no. He was always against extremism. He discouraged and he even spoke strongly against extremism. Our crown prince was saying that recently, saying, don't be extreme in religion, don't be extreme in religion, don't be extreme in religion, three times. The extremism of the Islam taught in Saudi Arabia, often called Wahhabi or Salafi Islam, has affected Angawi directly in his work. He started a center in Jeddah to preserve the Islamic and natural environment of the holy areas of Mecca, the birthplace of Muhammad, and Medina, which houses the Prophet's tomb. He said much of historic Mecca, as seen in this old footage, has been razed to the ground, partly to build accommodations for the millions of annual pilgrims, but more ominously, because religious leaders in Saudi Arabia fear historic sites will be used for a form of idol worship. I feel very, you know, bad about those places being gone. And, like this you know, like this, this one here is uh, one example, and I have many other examples. This is the tomb of the first wife of the Prophet, which was the, there, and it's totally demolished. And it's gone because of certain viewpoint 
that this could lead to adultery. Again, it another could lead to idolatry. Idolatry, yes. Uh, again, another site which I worked on uh, in, 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 in discovering and actually digging the, the house of the Prophet in Mecca near the mosque, and it has to be taken away and covered away. Is out. Angawi also said that in the great mosque in the old days, four schools of thought were taught and that a pilgrim could choose up to 35 different rings of teaching in the courtyards. I asked him what it's like now. Unfortunately, it developed into a way which is only one viewpoint is presented. Uh, and of course, if you all the time just listen to yourself or those who only com compliment you all the time, you think you, you're right and nobody else is, is right. So now if there's really only one form of Islam being taught in Mecca and Medina, that's spreading all over the Muslim world, isn't it? Mecca is very, uh, I think, critical, uh, and Medina, that uh, the, the, the beauty of the diversity, the beauty of the tradition that uh, is, like I explained, many-sided views and so on, is, is, is in a way has been now very much limited to basically one viewpoint. I'm not saying that viewpoint is maybe wrong or bad. I'm just saying that we need to balance and we need to listen to different views. Very essential now, as we are going part of the world, Islam is the religion of balance. If we cannot do it in Mecca and Medina, where can we do it? Angawi says his house is his answer to how more balance can be achieved through evolution, a respect for the past and not radical change. He promotes dialogue about Islam in his work in Jeddah, as well as at Harvard, where he teaches part of each year. And he is convinced evolutionary change in his religion is already underway. I'm living now, but living now does not mean that you cut yourself from the past. Or appreciating the past and carrying on with it doesn't mean that you do not live now. And that was always the challenge in Islamic tradition, Islamic culture, is to carry on. Sami Ngawi, thanks for being with us. Thank you very much. That's the last of our series from Saudi Arabia. An editor's note, Prince Turki Al Faisal, who appeared in Elizabeth's first two reports, was identified incorrectly as half-brother of the king. He's the son of the late King Faisal and nephew of the current king.